to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Uh, we have as our guest today someone who's a uh, husband, a uh, married man, been in the, served in the military, uh, is the leader of men, has helped establish um, one of the biggest men's conferences, I think the biggest men's conference in the world. And uh, so we're excited to have Matt Strub on our, as our guest today, the Bear Wozniak Adventure. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is our basic creed here is that the most the most thrilling, the, the, the greatest adventure you can have in your life is to abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. And God's will is wild. That's because God is wild. Uh, I remember in the, in the C.S. Lewis uh, book, The Chronicle of Narnia, at one point Aslan said, uh, um, what is it he said? He said, I, I'm, I'm a, a good lion, but that doesn't mean I'm a tame lion. And that's the kind of man that we have with us today, Matt Strub. Matt, aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, Matt. Uh, th those, by the way, we're, we go out on about 500 of the EWTN radio stations, and we go out on shortwave radio, and we go out on uh, all kinds of um, different uh, apps, you know, podcast apps. But we're on YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel, too, so people can actually see what he looks like. And in the background behind him, I'll paint a picture for you, there's all these awards on his wall. I see, I think, in one corner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Oh, there's two of them. <laughs> Two Nobel Peace Prizes. Uh, there's the My Daddy is the, the Greatest Dad in the World, which I would have to question because I think I am. <laughs> and, uh, but we see a, a, a picture of a helicopter and a Christmas tree and a bicycle. So it's just great to have an uh, opportunity for you guys to watch it on YouTube if you'd like. Matt, are you ready for, uh, for a ride? I, I am ready for a ride, and uh, boy, Nobel Peace Prize is uh, sure a stretch there. there <laughs> I thought I'm pretty sure that's straight. what that was. Hey, uh, you know what? Um, last night, going to sleep, you know, I, I stay up really late, sometimes as late as 9 o'clock, you know, and trying to go to sleep, and all of a sudden there's all these helicopters. I mean, maybe a dozen helicopter passes buzzing right by our, my condo window because we're on the beach here in, in, uh, in Cocoa Beach today. And they're on their way over to, uh, I think, Mike Spence, the vice president, is staying about a half mile north. And there's going to be a big rocket launch here. So, uh, But I remember when I was a private pilot, when I would hear helicopter pilots talk, they all talk <laughs> kind of like this. So I thought that's how you were going to talk when you came on the show. Is yeah, that we get that vibration in us and uh, it just kind of comes out. Uh, that uh, love the sound of freedom with those helicopters flying overhead, right? Yeah, that is true. That's so true. But yeah, I remember when I, as a private pilot, when you'd hear the, the, the helicopter pilots come on to talk to, uh, to talk to each other, to, I mean, to talk to the tower, you all, you all had that voice, but I guess it was just something to do with the, the helicopter. Yeah. So, hey, uh, Matt, let's get, let's, let's kind of uh, get started telling us just a little bit about your personal background, you, you know, your life story and, uh, you know, falling madly in love and all that kind of stuff. Uh, give us, give us the little bit of that story. Sure, I, uh, I've been blessed. I, I was able to marry my high school sweetheart. Uh, um, going back to those uh, high school and early college years, uh, living in Minnesota. That's where we grew up. Grew up Catholic, um, but as I uh, moved away from home, uh, starting our life, uh, kind of drifted away and just maybe was lukewarm at best, would go through the motions and showed up at Mass uh, because I, obligation, right? But did you feel uh, you had been catechized? Did you understand your faith at a deeper level or just a, just a surface sort of? Just the surface. I, I believe it was a, a poor catechism growing up. Um, I think the, uh, um, our parents meant well, but they trusted the schools and um, it just wasn't being done well. Um, so it was all watered down, feel good type of Catholicism. And, uh, so that just wore off and the feel good wears off and there's nothing deep there. So, uh, I had to learn that my own as an adult, which caused some trouble, turbulent times there in our early years. Uh, my wife and I struggled. Well, you, uh, you guys were married when you were in college, right? Yes. 
Yeah, we got married before I uh, graduated college. Uh, actually had uh, one child and one on the way. Um, and uh, Which one we, child did you have? Because I just saw a child walk by. I think she's trying yeah. to get at her Christmas presents down there. For those of you who are watching YouTube <laughs> with us. So that is our two-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter. Oh, who, but I want one of those. Yeah, so... Thanks be to God. Um, number four is coming today. So we're watching our uh, two and a half year old because our daughter is uh, going in for a birth this morning. Uh, oh, my. Oh, praise Branch God. Number four. Wow. Praise God. So she came down to turn on the tree. <laughs> ah, that's beautiful. OK, so but so we're going back to in, in, you. You married your high school sweetheart while you were in college. Yes. And all of a sudden it's rock and roll time, right? Life starts to happen. It does. Um, you know, in great intentions. We're going to wait uh, until I graduate, get a job to have some kids, but that wasn't God's plan. And uh, so we embraced the children, but life was chaotic uh, those early years, and we didn't have the grounding, deep faith uh, to rely on, so we were trying to do it all on our own. Thus caused the struggle. How old were you when your first child was born? Uh, 21 years old. So in a lot of ways, you were a kid yourself Absolutely. almost. Yeah, yeah. Knew it all at the time, right? But yeah. <laughs> so then, so you, you graduated from college, and then uh, where, did, where did you had a child while you were in college, or two while you were in college, or? Yeah. So just as I graduated, our second one was born. Uh, so we had Samantha and Nicholas, and then uh, headed off to uh, flight school with the army. So down to Fort Rucker, Alabama, my wife and I, and the two children, uh, all the way across the country from Minnesota, to Alabama. Where were, were you living in Minnesota? Uh, St. Paul. Uh, oh, okay. So St. Paul is the tropical side of the Twin Cities, isn't it? Min Min Minneapolis is the cold, cold side, right? Pretty Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Sunny, okay. eighty-five every day. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Uh, so you, so you headed down to Alabama, and had you ever been down in that area before? No. Yeah. Um, beautiful. It's surprisingly beautiful country, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, yeah. Way warmer than we expected. Uh, the summers were uh, excruciatingly hot. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, but you yeah. had the biggest fan in the world when you were in that helicopter. You had the biggest, you know, rotator fan you could have. Your wife's suffering, but you, you're up there getting in the comfort of of a you know fan blowing over your head. Absolutely. So how, what was that like getting trained? To give us the first that process of becoming a, a, a chopper pilot. So it, it was interesting, right? I I, uh, I truly thought. This is, this is what I want to do. I was excited about it. Uh, but I tell you, the first flight that I went on, um, it was one instructor and uh, two students. So let me back up just a little bit. You start out uh, with ground school, starting out uh, with uh, about two months in the classroom, learning about flying. And then when you go and do the actual flight training, it's two students to one instructor. So... Uh, I happened to be the uh, student sat in the back for the first half of the flight. And during that first half, we're flying along and uh, the instructor initiates what's called an auto rotation where you're up at altitude and they roll the throttle to idle and then you fall out of the sky like a rock. I'm in the back seat and I almost lose my lunch. And <laughs> am I in the wrong business? I, I don't know that I'm going to make it. Oh, uh, uh, It's not only do you... You're, you're, you're physically reacting, but your mind is, yeah, I know. I think well, I, I have a, you know, my private pilot license and I just remember that's what they did. The first thing is that now this is what a stall is. And then you <laughs> just fall out of the sky. <laughs> I think it separates the men from the boys or something. I don't know. It so, must. And I thought I was a boy at that time. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Were you crying out, mommy, help yeah. me. <laughs> but then uh, they throw you into the front seat, right? Yeah. Now, yeah, now when uh, you're the captain in a, in a helicopter, are you on the left side or on the right side, right seat? So the pilot seat is in the right seat. Uh, airplane, that's in the left seat. Yeah, so you guys are all messed up. That's right, backwards. <laughs> I'll say, okay, so then uh, what happened when you first got a hold of those controls? So once I got in the front, uh, I got a little more air, got uh, visibility. Uh, I calmed down, stomach calmed down, and then I uh, got in a groove, and, and truly it has been uh, a great experience. I've been flying now for uh, about 26 years with the military, and it's been great. Wow. We, had, we got to interview Tom Equals. He's a, one of the very best friends of Archbishop Wenske. He rode motorcycles with us with the Archbishop down to Key West, and he was a chopper pilot in Vietnam. 
and made a couple of hard landings, you know, a couple couple of unexpected landings. What were what was your role then with that with, with as a chopper pilot? Did you go overseas doing uh, were you involved in any action or what, what was that all about? Sure. So I I've been in uh, now a total 32 years. Wow. Uh, first enlisted as a helicopter mechanic uh, while I was still in high school, but uh, I've deployed four times, uh, two times stateside supporting the uh, uh, units that went overseas and then twice uh, overseas. Once I spent a year in Iraq in 2010-11 and then a year in Afghanistan in 2016-17. Uh, wow. Listen, you, we got to take a quick break here. We're talking with Matt Strub. He's someone I've been trying to get on the show, and we kind of, I think, fumbled the last the last go at it, but we got him on our show now, and we're going to be talking with some of the – about him – about some of the things he's involved with in men's ministry when we get back, a little bit more about uh, uh, that, the, his helicopter background. Uh, this is Bear Wozniak with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to thank our sponsors, Solidarity Healthcare and Notre Dame Federal Credit Union. We'll be right back. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Uh, this is your host, Bear Wozniak. I want to let people know to go to our website, deepadventure.com. Because when you go there, uh, both of my books are available, Deep in the Wave, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, which was a bestseller published by Hachette. And then uh, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, uh, published by Franciscan Media. They're both great books to give uh, for, for as Christmas presents that we can direct ship them for you. You can get them on Amazon too, but if you go to our website, you can get autographed copies of them. And uh, we want to let, let people know our, our reality TV show, Long Ride Home, uh, just did a, a, was, was groundbreaking in that it was uh, only the second uh, EWTN TV show to be put on the Armed Forces Network, as well as now we have it on iTunes, Prime Video, and Google Play. So it's a great thing if you have a, a brother-in-law or, or, or a son coming home uh, to, put, to power watch our, the Prime Video version of Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. It's... A, it's it's about four to five. We get to as many 10, 10 riders riding from San Diego to Jacksonville, San Diego, excuse me, Jacksonville, Florida, to San Diego Beach. And uh, um, so from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. And along the way, we really uh, challenge each other and go deep with, with each other. And we have a lot of really great content. So really encouraging you to power watch that when you're within your families uh, together. Matt Strub, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Bear. Great to be with you. You know, I'm looking at that bicycle behind you, and I realize that is a trainer, right? You've got it. That, that, that's uh, that's what you do. But where? That's what you do in Minnesota during the winter, right? You got to have an indoor bicycle. That's that's right. Um, you can't go outside. Uh, you know, you got to bundle up. Uh, yeah, somehow got to keep moving, keep the uh, juices flowing. So, yeah, the, the bike's on the trainer, and the treadmill's behind it. But, but, it's, but that's a real. That's your real bicycle. But you have it on a on a on a. Uh, an, an adapter so that you can use it inside or is it exactly right yep. so that's your bicycle where do you go on that bicycle what do you what do you what do you like to do so so i've just recently transitioned to biking a little bit to try to save the knees i've been mostly a runner mm. uh, using uh, the treadmill in the winters and outside in the summers but uh, so just bike around here i haven't biked um, long distances uh, just just around well you know what I, so i used to hike a lot in the mountains, right? In Southern California before I moved to Hawaii. And, uh, and I'd see these mountain bikers flying by and go, they're getting to see more things, plus they're air-conditioned because they have the breeze. That's right. So I got a really cheap, inexpensive mountain bike. And I ended up pedaling that thing across the United States from San Diego to Jacksonville. But um, you know what? I learned something really. When you're on a bicycle and you're outside, don't, even in Minnesota where it's, it's not mountainous, but it's very hilly, rolling, you pedal uphill most of the time. Doesn't it seem like that? Absolutely. It seems like you're always going uphill. <laughs> yeah, you get that. It takes you just a few moments to get down a hill because you go so fast, and then here comes the grind again. And, and uh, that's kind of like what life feels like, doesn't it? Absolutely. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, there's always good times, but uh, you seem to – the suffering comes, and it seems like uh, you power through it. It's kind of like uh, that, that heartbeat, you know, the two, two – there's the, there's the two beats and then, then the rest. Well, you know what? I live in Cocoa Beach, Florida now, part of the year too. And Cindy and I get on our bicycle. And you want to know how I motivate myself to work out? How so? First of all, the land is, is totally flat. 
I don't think it wasn't until recently that my wife had ever ha- walked up a hill. You know what I mean? She's a mo- she's a she's a downhill uh, body, uh, you know, uh, border, you know, a snow snow border. But that sure. the chairlift takes you up the hill, right? Yep. So now she and I have been walking up and down hills all over. But when we bicycle, it's totally flat. There's a Starbucks between here and where we're going to have breakfast. So in case we have to hit, take a stop. But basically, the goal is to get to where the breakfast is. So it's about a seven mile pedal, but it's just nice and beautiful and smooth and it's just really nice being on a bicycle. I don't know. And it, but, you know, you're right. It's so good for us with our, with our knees yeah. and our joints. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, age is creeping up on me, and I want to be able to stay active as long as I can. So yeah, meetings. I love that because uh, one of the, I think one of the challenges I see with a lot of men these days is uh, they're not taking care of their health. And it's, it's not taking care of your health is the same thing as not taking care of your family because you're not as alert, you're not as... Uh, you're not able to be as productive, and you're going to die young. Absolutely, and if I want to get down on the ground and play with the grandkids, or uh, you know, spend some time uh, just interacting with the kids as they get older, I need to have that health for sure. Hey, we're going to get back to to where we left off uh, at the last segment, but can you give me a little breakout of what do you do? What is your what is your health protocol? How do you keep fit? Yeah, so I um, I generally do. Um, just basic calisthenics, um, you know, push-ups, sit-ups uh, in uh, in the evening time before I go to bed, and then in the morning uh, I'll get up and uh, three to four days a week I'm either on the treadmill, on elliptical, or on the bike. And yeah, the push-up uh, is like the perfect exercise, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's good. It's um, you know it, it works many different muscles. It keeps the core strong and uh, just uh, it gets the heartbeat up quickly. What okay? So I'll ask you part two of that. What about your eating regimen? So I eat everything my wife feeds me, and it's probably uh, she's a great cook. She uh, <laughs> always does, uh, you know, the the balanced meals. Uh, uh-huh. I'm extremely spoiled. She packs me a lunch, so uh, you know I take a lunch to work, and I open it up, and it's a surprise every day. It's, and it's oh, always what? Good. Doesn't that feel good? I mean, it just feels so good when a woman gives you food. <laughs> my wife's a great cook. She keeps us mainly on a low carb, you know, type regimen, but she's such okay. a great cook. Uh, and, you know, but, but, you know, and, the, and, the, and sleep is so important too, but when you have babies, sometimes that's hard to come by, right? Uh, Absolutely. Well, you know, but it's the same thing with your, our prayer. I think your, your physical fit fitness regime, uh, what is your, what is your spiritual protocol? What do you, what, how, what's your, your weekly, your, your daily prayer life? What, do, what is that? In sure. Your life? Sure. So I, I, um, I have an hour commute into work now. So, uh, the first thing I do is get up in the morning, have breakfast, and then uh, get in the car, um, turn off the radio right away, and I say the rosary. So the first thing is uh, rosary on the way in. Um, you know, just starting the rosary, uh, thank the Lord for the blessings of my life, and have my intentions for the day. And uh, first and foremost is uh, the family, uh, the church, uh, praying for our culture of life. Um, and, uh, and then I say the rosary. So that's the first, you know, 20, 25 minutes of my uh, drive. What, tell me about that, that, that rosary experience. So, you, so it's, you, um, yeah. it's, it's powerful. I mean, we offer it to the lady. We ask the lady to be part of our life and uh, start the day right. Um, she has been instrumental in, in just my life, uh, our life as a married couple, my wife and I. Um, and I tell you, the... Uh, a story about the rosary in our lives and how powerful it is. After um, about seven years of marriage, um, we had come back to the faith. Uh, we were uh, becoming more vi- vibrant in our parish life, uh, our own prayer life. And then we had two children and we're, um, we're hoping for more and it just wasn't happening. So my wife and I took it to the lady um, and asked our lady for children. We were asking for another child, and we had a daily rosary in our house. We sat down with our two children, which were five and four at the time, and uh, and they prayed the rosary with us. And over time, you know, we're asking them for their intentions. Uh, our daughter would ask for a girl, and our son would ask for a boy, and we just asked for a healthy baby. And um, eventually, they're like, okay, well, we, we want both. We want twins. And um, that actually turned into, after uh, more than a year of daily rosary, the, the, uh, we were blessed with adopting two children, a girl and a boy, that were um, totally biological siblings. It was a Praise. blessing. And that, that, 
twins are very hard to be able to stay together, aren't they, when, when they need to be adopted? They're, so, it must be hard for them to find adopted parents who want twins. So, yeah, they're they're about two years apart, uh, but you know and siblings, it, yeah, and they're siblings, and uh, and truly, uh, the they wanted to keep them together, and it's hard to find homes for uh, multiple uh, siblings. So, but but our lady had a place for them, right? Absolutely. You know, as a war, you're you're a warrior. You know, I I've never been in the military. My son served uh, in the Navy on the on the uh, Bonham Richard, the amphibious assault carrier. So I have a glimpse of what you guys go through, but for me. Uh, my weapon really is like Padre Pio said. It's it's the rosary. I when we do our bicycle ride, uh, we I know if, even if we get to say anything, she's Cindy's praying her rosary and I'm praying mine, and we pray for each each of the kids, and then also have our dedications for the day. Wow, what a weapon! What a power! You know, I I talk about the rosary because I see the results. I used to think I knew how to pray uh, intercessory prayer, but nothing uh, like the the power of the rosary is just phenomenal. Absolutely. Uh, you know, my day's not complete unless I get the rosary in. And those days that I, I don't uh, drive to work, uh, we have a dog, a four-year-old lab. My wife and I take the dog for a walk, and uh, we pray We pray the rosary together on our walk. That's so beautiful. Well, we're talking with Matt Strubb. Uh, we're going get, to get into uh, some of the, the stuff he's involved in. That's what happens when you become a Catholic and you give your life to the Lord. He taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, I got some stuff for you to do. So we're going to be talking with Matt Strubb. This is Bear Wozniak. Uh, our website is deepadventure.com. We'd love for you to go there for the holidays. Uh, you know, we have really manly cigars, Matt. I have my seven virtue cigar samplers. And when you when you go to light the cigar, you'll see there's a, a Renaissance painting of the woman that represents that virtue, like of coraggio or courage. And then you have to unpeel the label in order to enjoy the whole cigar. And it's easy to unpeel. And inside there's a quote from one of my books on the virtues. And it seemed like a good idea, but I had no idea what a great idea it was because so many men have said, I, I shared that with my, my son or shared that with my dad. And instead of talking about sports or politics, we began to talk about the Lord. So uh, people can go there and send that out as a gift package if they go to deepadventure.com and go to our store. This is The Bear. We'll be right back with more of The Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I could hardly even say my first name. I mean, my last name. Wait, let, me, let me get another sip of coffee here. That ought to do it. This is Bear Wozniak with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I have as a guest today, Matt Strubb. And one of the things I love about the military people is they understand the fruit of discipline. You know, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be called a disciple. And right in that word, it says discipline. And discipline is not... a uh, if you want to be wild and free, the most important thing, if you really want to be just wild and free, is to be disciplined. Because if you're not, you start painting yourself into a corner, whether it's with your physical health or not paying your bills or not working a good job or you know relationships, not taking care of them. You find yourself painted into a corner and you have no freedom at all. So the key to being on a wild adventure and having the greatest freedom you could ever have is to be disciplined. And so Matt Strubb is talking to us a little bit about just the discipline of his prayer life. And we just just got to Our Lady, the, the daily rosaries, such a powerful weapon in our hands. What else What else uh, in your busy life with your children and grandchildren? Uh, tell us what else you fit into your life for your, for your prayer life. So I uh, read the daily scripture, uh, so the, the mass readings of every day, uh, and then a reflection on those mass readings. Um, I use the, uh, the app Ledette uh, in the car, so I have it in the audio, so I, I take advantage of my time in the car. Uh, make the most use of it. Um, and then uh, I do uh, try to get to Mass uh, throughout the week, um, a, one, at least one time in addition to the Sunday, Sunday uh, Mass. Um, a goal of mine in life is someday to get to daily Mass. Uh, just uh, I, I'm not there yet and uh, still working on that. Yeah, um, you know, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, and then, uh, and then evening prayers. Uh, you know, evening prayer with my wife, so we have some time together. So tell me about that. How how do, how, how do you structure that time? So I tell you what, uh, going back years ago when we started to get back to our faith, uh, I thought that was kind of odd, corny, a little uh, strange, you know, praying with my wife. And now I, I, I miss it if we don't get the chance to do it. Uh, but we just, uh, you know, we sit down in chairs next to each other. And we just count our blessings. Uh, we say... Uh, 
um, either a Hail Mary and Our Father, Glory Be. Uh, uh, and then we just um, pray for our children and uh, we pray for each other and whatever's on our mind. It's just a uh, uh, off-the-cuff prayer. See, what, what Matt's saying to us right now, gentlemen, just his spiritual, his, his, his spiritual practice, praying, taking advantage of the time that he has. Like for me, uh, we were stopped on the road once on Long Ride Home and, fought, and, I, and we had some downtime waiting for the cameras. And I go, Father Mark, what do you do when you're, when you're waiting like this? And he goes, the rosary, of course. You know, so I think a lot of adding that to your waiting by an elevator, why not pray the rosary? Or that awkward moment in the elevator with four other people, why not pray the rosary? You have found a way to build into your life at least an hour of prayer every day. And I really think that every man, if he's not praying an hour every day, uh, you're doing yourself and your family harm. We're meant to be dragon slayers, and an, an hour, an hour, an hour minimum, I think, is, is should be should be uh, the minimum of what each man should expect of himself in prayer. And so, so this this simple thing of you pray the rosary in the car, you're listening on the Laudate app to that day's uh, gospel, that day's readings from Mass. You're praying with your wife. These are the the go the things you're actually going to do, and then sometimes you add in going to Mass and other things like that. But that's the whole key: is that one hour. Is, is so important. And if you're not doing that, call yourself a Catholic, I would say you're a poser. Yeah, I agree. And, and Bear, in addition to that, I think, um, you know, getting to confession uh, once a month is uh, critical for me. It's that accountability. It's, it's being able to uh, bring to the Lord and, and actually talk about uh, where I failed and, and try to continue to, to do it better. Um, and if we don't do those things, um, we get lost and caught up in the rat race, which I've done uh, many times and focused on career and forgot about family and get things out of balance. It's, uh, it's not good. Well, there's no one busier than I know of than priests, and they go to Mass every day. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think Nick Saban does, too, is what, what I've heard. But uh, we're talking with Matt Strub. Matt, um, as we're going to leap a little bit forward here. Uh, you're, so you, you're with, you, you're with your, your wife, and you have a couple of children, and then what, what, what was it that brought you back uh, to really uh, take your faith in, in, and go deeper with the Lord? So uh, we were married about seven years. And uh, like I said, we were struggling as a couple. And uh, um, I just, uh, we were on the brink of divorce, uh, to be quite honest. And, and uh, I truly didn't want that. And so I started um, being open to uh, my wife, uh, her nudging and the faith. We had a great uh, Catholic priest at our parish, talked to him and then some good friends. And so what happened was one of the men in the parish asked me to join him and one other gentleman to get together. Um, and we got together once a week and just talked about what's going on in our lives. And then we studied the catechism together. We just opened the catechism and studied uh, the catechism to learn our faith better. Did you go through the whole catechism? Did you start at the beginning and just work your way through? So we didn't get through the entire uh, catechism. We started, um, um, we opened the book and started wherever it took us. If we had an issue that we were concerned about or thought about uh, that we weren't sure about, we would find it and then study that. Um, and then we, we just, whatever came up that day, whatever was prompted, we worked on. You know what that's, Matt, I've never heard of anybody doing that before. Um, I'm a big, I, I, you know, I, every morning I teach a 15-minute catechism class. On, on, on Facebook Live. It's called Ocean Sunrise Catechism. The ocean is usually behind me. <clears throat> the sun is somewhere out there or not out there yet, but at 7 a.m. I do a 15-minute, and we go, we're going line by line through the catechism. We're on about page, paragraph 2300 now, so we're about two-thirds of the way through. We've been doing, we're on our third year of doing this now. Um, and I just love the catechism, but it's not something, I mean, I've read through it several times, but it's kind of like you said, you read the morning scriptures or you're reading the catechism. Really, it's reading you. It's kind of dissecting you, right? Uh, it kind of like a mirror, it kind of reveals what's in your heart. But I just think that's so cool. And I think the key part of what you said was you and a couple other men. Start, it, it, if you're not in a small group like that with you and a few men and you're not getting together once a week or once every two weeks, um, then do it. You know, we have a thing at my ministry, Matt, called Bears Man Cave. <clears throat> Men go to my website, and they sign up for the Man Cave, and then we give them access to a secret Facebook group where we, where we post our, our prayer requests, inspiring thoughts, or, or, or challenging each other. 
And then every two weeks, we get on Zoom meetup, and we have video chat, and we're going through my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, which is short five-minute chapters designed for that type of setting. But if, you, if you're in a church and there's no men's group, then go make one. Uh, and, and start off by just saying, hey, guys, let's have breakfast together once a week, or let's have lunch, or maybe get together on the back porch of my deck and have a cigar and shot of whiskey, and let's talk about the Lord, right? It needs to be, you don't have a group there, it's your fault. I totally agree. It's, uh, that's fantastic. And being able to get together with men and share our struggles and prop each other up, that's, uh, that's where uh, rubber meets the road. Yeah, and, you're, and, you're, and you, I think you really said something special, too, uh, with, your, with uh, going to confession. By the way, as a, as a chopper pilot, were you required to learn to skydive? Uh, it wasn't required, but I did. That was one of the things I did while I was in my officer training. I uh, had a chance to do uh, jump school, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, it was a great experience. Well, did you were you did you jump from twelve thousand feet or did you did you have a static line or? Yeah, a static line uh, about fifteen hundred feet. Jump out, it comes open on its own. Oh my goodness, at fifteen hundred feet. Yep. So there's no chance to, to to pull a reserve from that level. Well, if you have your reserve, but yes, uh, there's not a lot of time. You got to <laughs> get it done uh, in a hurry. <laughs> well, okay. So I have always said going to confession is like jumping out of an airplane. You know that first moment when you're kind of in trepidation and there's a bunch of people in line in front of you? Yeah, that's a good visual. <laughs> you're right. You're kind of nervous, right? And then when you open that, when that canopy opens up overhead, you feel that sense of uh, perspective, relief. right? Yeah, relief, um, freeness, uh, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. And when you land, what did you feel like the first time? Uh, <laughs> felt like I just got punched. <laughs> oh, hard landing? It was, uh, you know, so uh, the military parachutes uh, you have a couple different va variants, but uh, you get down pretty quick. You know, they don't want you don't want to be in the sky as a target uh, long. Right. So you move along pretty quick, and you do what's called a parachute landing fall when you hit the ground. And if you don't do it exactly right, uh, it'll hurt. The first time wasn't uh, perfect. Is that where you have your your feet together, knees together, slightly bent, and hit and roll? Yep, hit and roll. But didn't it feel good to be on the ground? It did. It felt great. Yeah, I'm back on the ground. This is over. This is, uh, is awesome. Did you feel like you could get go, could do anything, accomplish anything after that? What a what a confidence booster! Absolutely, you feel like uh, I have uh, succeeded. I can do this. And that's what confession is. Absolutely. It gets, you know, you all those elements are there. There's this this worry. Oh, I got to go talk to this guy about all the stuff I did wrong. And then you're in this line, and the nuns take an hour to go through their confession, and then finally it's your turn. And then you jumped, and you and, and and there's when you see people jump out of a plane, you see such a joy on their face usually, right? And then when you land, you feel free, and that's so. If you haven't been to confession in a while, go this week. We've been talking with uh, Matt Strub. He's one of the men's leaders in the in Milwaukee, and we're going to talk to him about uh, what they did to help launch the biggest men's conference in the world. Um, Matt Strub, uh, th we'll be right back. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. For those who, if you don't know it, uh, we go out over about 500 EWTN radio stations. So I don't know how many million listen to this show. And we also are on all the podcast net, uh, apps like iTunes and all those other podcast apps, Blog Talk Radio. But we also go out over the YouTube video and uh, we stream it so you can go and watch Matt Strub. And what, what just happened just now during the break is his wife came in, is whispering in the background and there's a little grandchild running in the background trying to knock over the Christmas tree, which I was praying she would so we could get that on our YouTube channel. Uh, I just love the organic way that we do the radio show. And, 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 and it's wonderful to hear his wife's beautiful voice and to see the grandchildren running around. It, it testifies to uh, God's goodness and, and, and this man's commitment to, uh, to the Lord. So, uh, Matt, uh, can you share with us a little bit about what, uh, what inspired the men's conference, this the biggest men's conference in the country, maybe in the world, there in Milwaukee. Yeah, so uh, a, a priest friend of ours, uh, Father Mike Leitner and uh, Kevin O'Brien, uh, were talking and this, uh, they, they were had the vision that we need to have a men's conference in Milwaukee. I invited myself and two other gentlemen together. Uh, we sat in a, a kitchen of Randy Wikes' house and said, uh, how are we going to put on a men's conference? And uh, that was in 2005. And uh, summertime of 2005, 
And in uh, February of 2006, we had our first uh, Men of Christ Catholic Men's Conference here in Milwaukee. Uh, we were hoping for 500 guys. We had over 2,000, and it was just a miracle how it all came together. Uh, we have been going, uh, this will be our 13th year this coming uh, March, um, anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 guys every year. And it's truly been an inspiration. Uh, it's been you know, a blessing to me and all the guys that are involved and truly uh, transforming for the Diocese of Milwaukee. That's the way it is. It seems like the Lord just gives you a little nudge, and you take one step forward, and then it's up to Him. You know, but, but what I love about what I see with these men's conferences is they have the best practices approach to launching this. Everyone's using their skill set. They're very, very diligent, very disciplined about it, but then, then the Lord brings this, and, and there's a lot of prayer behind it, too, and then the Lord brings this fruit. Absolutely. My wife jokes... Uh, you know, we, we pull it together, we pull it off, it comes together every year, and she jokes that uh, if they only knew what kind of shoestrings was in the background and making this happen, yeah. just <laughs> the guys that are doing this as volunteers. Um, but uh, you're right, I mean, best practices. We share uh, our experiences with others. Others have shared their experiences with us and helped us, and it just comes together. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Because um, I've gone to, I've, I speak primarily at men's conferences, and then uh, the Legatus people love them too. And uh, I've seen, I'm going to say, I've been to a conference that really wasn't, could have been so much better, a couple of them, you know, that could have been so much better. So it wasn't for their lack of having heard from the Lord or, or being on the right track. But most of the men involved in putting on these conferences are not professional conference givers, right? And so something really cool is happening right now where people can come, men are coming together who are trying to lead men's groups in the church or, or do conferences and are learning and sharing resources. Can you tell us about that vision and what that's about? Absolutely. Yeah. About a year ago, uh, Robert Tunmeyer, Kevin O'Brien, and uh, Matthew Kristoff uh, uh, got together. We actually, got together via the phone because uh, one's in Minnesota, one's in Texas, and two of us are in Wisconsin. And uh, we started uh, a vision to bring nationally these men's groups together. Um, we had our first... Uh, summit in June here in Milwaukee. We had 85 guys from around the country come. And uh, these are leaders of men's ministries throughout the country that have come together and help build what is now the Catholic Men's Leadership Alliance. And it is growing. It's already well over 200 individuals strong from around the country. Um, and what it is, is it's to bring unity to the ministry to men the men's ministry that's around uh, throughout the country. And we actually have one gentleman coming from Singapore. So it's uh, truly going worldwide. But this is about, like you said, sharing resources, helping each other with best practices so that we can empower men to continue on with their own ministries. We don't want to take over um, or, or change what they're doing. We want to help enhance and help them to have the fervor, the desire, and the drive to continue on. Yeah, there's just there's just a way that there's just some things that work really that work really well. You don't want to program program them, but there are some things that really don't work at all. <clears throat> and why not learn uh, from it from the from each other and learn to do it right? You know, one of my favorite verses is the book of Nehemiah, uh, where he uh, comes back to Jerusalem and it's time to rebuild the walls. I have a talk I gave give called "Call to the Wall," and what I love about it is it's the domestic church when they rebuild those walls. Uh, it describes one man and his family built the wall from this, from here to here, and then, and then this man and his family rebuilt the wall from here to here, and this man and his family rebuilt the wall from here to here. And when they got kind of successful, the local, uh, you know, non-Jewish people there uh, got got upset and they started to attack them. And so while while one was building, another one stood there with a shield and a spear. And those that were carrying the supplies carried a sword already taken out of the scabbard, holding their sword and the supplies in the other hand. This is the picture of the men's conferences, of men coming together, spear and sword, guarding each other, protecting each other, and, and we need each other. It's the domestic church. And right now, with the challenge that's going in the church, we need the laity to, be, to take their role that they've, they've, they've been charged with, that they're supposed to be having, and we need manly virtue. We need men to lead their families uh, in the church to restore uh, the breach in the wall. Absolutely. It's so important that uh, you know, we don't lose heart. The, the, uh, the church prevails. 
Um, we can't lose faith in that uh, you know, eternal life is, is there. The Lord, Jesus Christ, uh, he saved us all, and, and the church will prevail. The, um, but, but we have to do our part. We have to step up and uh, stand in the breach. We can't just let uh, you know, folks uh, tear down the church. Uh, it, it is uh, so important that we have the sacraments. We need to be able to receive the Eucharist, to go to the, receive confession, to baptize our children. We need the sacraments, so we need to defend our faith and defend the church in these tough times. Yeah, you know what? Uh, you know, being a student of church history, by the way, the church, Catholic Church does have history. It wasn't started by someone 10 years ago. Uh, you see, uh, like, I think the, the greatest example of this is during the Arian heresy when the bishop, bishop after bishop was kicked out and an Arian bishop was put in his place, you know, the, the basic heresy that Jesus is not God, that he's just the highest created being, uh, the, the, the church woke up one day and found itself an Arian church, Arian bishops everywhere. And I think right now we have a lot of bishops, priests, and leaders that are heretics. Um, but our responsibility isn't to sit there and complain like people watching the nightly news and yelling at the t TV camera. Our job is to pray for our bishops, our job is to take our place as the laity to, uh, to uh, share the gospel and to hold our bishops accountable uh, in various ways. Father Mark Goring is doing something really exciting. People can uh, go to his Facebook channel, his uh, YouTube channel, Father Mark Goring, and he's calling together a group of men, and I'm going to put him in touch with you guys, okay? But he's gathering people together, not just men, but people together, so that when, when a, a certain priest who's preaching that same-sex attraction is okay, comes into your town, and you know about it, we can call and mobilize people to go down to the bishop, 20 of them, 30 of them, 50 of them, and say this can't happen, or, or other sort of things like that where people are receiving communion and you know that they're, they're, uh, they're a mason or something like that. There's, I, we see these sort of things all the time. The laity has to become involved. And you're, the group that you're, that you, you're developing, this, this fellowship of, 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 men, of leaders, of men, what is it called again? Catholic Men's Leadership Alliance. And how do they find that on the internet? How do they contact you? So our website is about to go live here um, by the end of the month. So we're, we've been in development over the summer. Um, it'll be a top-notch website. Uh, we don't even have the the, uh, the name of the site yet. Okay. Um, but I, I will give out my uh, personal email, which is what we've been using so far to connect men and uh, uh, whatnot. So it is Matt Strub. 15 at gmail.com. So it's Matt with two T's and then Strub, just S-T-R-U-B, 15 at gmail.com. We've been talking with Matt Strub. Uh, the hour goes by pretty fast. In fact, I think he has to go to please place his daughter's about to give birth. And so it's kind of a, probably the most urgent reason for us to end this radio show on time. We want to invite everybody to go to the Bear Wozniak uh, YouTube channel and subscribe. We're trying to add 700, 600 more subscribers so YouTube will start punching our our YouTube channel up and go to our website, deepadventure.com and become a member, become a monthly donor uh, because that this show exists and our TV show exists because of you uh, until next week. May the breath of the Holy spirit. Aloha you. Aloha Matt. Thank you. God bless you. And we'll be praying for the birth of your, your, your grandchild. Thank you very much. God bless. Appreciate yeah, it. Being I hope to see you in Milwaukee one of these days. Sounds great. In fact, okay. you know, we're going to be, be there in August shooting long ride home. All right. Well, I'll okay. make sure I uh, get to meet you. Okay. Aloha. Aloha. You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwozniak.com.